Open your Bibles, please, to chapter 38 of Job. I had to call it something, so I called it Donkeys, Doggies, Dinosaurs, Dragons, and the Devil, because we'll cover all that tonight. Uh, I, I don't expect that we're going to get to chapter 42, but I do hope that we're going to make our way through... Um, from, we're, we, we ended about midway, I think, through chapter 38 last time, and uh, so we're going to go through as much of that as, as I can do. Um, one of the things, you know, as, uh, and certainly God's not asking these questions of Job to challenge his scientific understanding, per se, but I think it's good for us to consider it that way. Um, science claims to be the pursuit of truth, and, and some of us may, be, you know, may scoff at that, you know, we hear that, but the reality is, as you know, science at its root, that's exactly what it is. Uh, science, when you think of the founding fathers of science, people like Newton, um, Boyle, uh, Pascal, people like this, these are solid believers who were in pursuit of the truth behind you know, uh, biosystems, ecology in general, the universe, all to the glory of God. Now, as humanism has, has crept into basically every field of scientific endeavor, um, that, that's not the goal, right? It still is the goal for many Christians who are involved, but uh, maybe some of you are involved in that area, but uh, that's a tough area for believers to be involved in in any of those fields because a, a Christian perspective, the idea that there, that there is an intelligence, not just some obscure deity somewhere, but that there is a personal God who is the designer of all that we see. Uh, that's not a, obviously it's the understatement to say it's not a, a popular view. Um, what's sad is how many Christians have, um, you know, but how many Christians by their indifference have yielded to that. And I mean, one area of that is uh, like deistic evolution, if you're familiar with that idea. The idea that, um, well, we don't understand how it all came about. I mean, I'm a Christian, but you know, maybe uh, God did use evolution. You know, and that, that's, it's a very slippery slope. That cascades very quickly if you start to go there. I'm not going there tonight, but I just want to say that's an important thing. So as believers, it's really important for us to continue to keep a very clear biblical understanding of uh, of creation, of the design of all things, and that's one of the things I love about this um, this portion of the book of Job is that as God's asking Job these questions, He has a different intention behind it. You know, He's challenging Job because of the things that Job has said, because of uh, Job's concerns uh, and and his emotional outbursts about this is not fair, what's happening to me, um, if only I could die, it would be better. You know, things that are frankly not uncommon to any of us emotionally. Uh, God now challenges him and says, so were you there, right? When, when I laid the foundations of the earth, etc." cetera. Um, but even so, even though, he, even though God's intention in asking these questions is not to challenge a scientific understanding, it's it's great for us to also read it in that way. Um, most of us appreciate, though I don't know how many people are familiar with the term anthropic principle. Okay, so a few people know it. The idea, the anthropic principle, is that as scientists look at the Earth, uh, look at where we are in the solar system, where the solar, how the solar system is designed, uh, where the solar system is in the Milky Way galaxy, um, even uh, what we may consider simple things like where the moon is, our moon in relation to the earth, why we have eclipses or total eclipses, the fact that that's only found on planet earth, the other, the other planets in the solar system never have anything like that, never experience anything like that. The idea that if we were just a little bit closer to the sun, life would not be sustainable. We'd all burn up. If we were just a little bit further away, life would not be sustainable. Everything would be frozen. Um, and you could start to move down the list, and I'll touch on some of those things tonight, um, just to see how, again, you know, is it by chance? Or is it by design? Even uh, the genetic code, and many of us, you know, we're, we're more familiar now, most people, uh, with the idea of, of genes, the genetic code, 
which is the blueprint of all life forms. Every single life form has a, a, a genetic makeup. And I, I don't, I, you know, I'd have, to, I'd have to do more research to come and talk to you about the genetic code, although, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered by it. Um, but the, on the simplest level, if I may, the idea that it's a digital code. Now, what I mean by a digital code, if I say... You know what that is? Well, it's Morse code, but what does it mean? SOS, you know your Morse code, okay. So that's a digital code. The only reason we communicate is because you already understood the code, right? So when, when Morse code was developed in the 1800s, the idea is that as naval, uh, as navies understood Morse code, now in emergency or for any other purpose, uh, they could communicate with one another. Or, uh, gosh, I remember Boy Scouts using flags for that same purpose. Um, the only way that works is that someone on the other side can look at the flags and say, I know what that means. That's a digital code as opposed to something that's um, analog. And so that, that idea of digital code puts, it just puts to death the idea that anything spontaneously exists. It just comes into being through spontaneity because it already has a digital code that makes it up. That means a designer had to create that code in order for every other cell in the body, for example, to interpret that code and know what to do. Now, I'm not gonna, I shouldn't, shouldn't have gone too far down the road. I'm just trying to lay out some ideas that we just don't think about that frequently. And, and I believe that that's part of the reason why so many Christians sometimes can just sort of cave when it comes to science. We're afraid to even get into it. I'm no scientist. I, I'm, I mean, I'm I always say I'm technical enough to be dangerous. Uh, hey, I went to a liberal arts college. I'm a public school guy. I went to liberal arts college. I studied polit political science and economics, you know, <laughs> and sociology, which is the armpit of the social sciences, you know. And now I'm a pastor. <laughs> right. God's clearly have a, has a sense of humor, right? And, and just because I spent 25 years in business and in both cases was involved in some technical fields, I, I've learned to use the technical, some, some of the technical education that I had through high school and college. And suddenly it came alive to me. It made sense to me. And so I'm no scientist. It's just that I can read what's in front of me and understand it. You don't have to be trained you don't need a master's degree in organic chemistry or, or physics or any of those things. All we have to do is read and trust that God really is who he says he is, that he really is the one who's, who's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, that nothing would exist without him breathing life in the first place. So, all right, so last time um, we got to the point after... Uh, what did we have? Um, I guess we had uh, 20 or a total of 35 chapters. We had the first two chapters where we have the heavenly scene and we see what happens to Job and his family. And then a total of 35 chapters, 29 of which were Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar giving their opinions to Job and Job giving his opinion or his, his defense back. And then when they were finished, the three the Ash Heap Trio, um, when they were finished, then Elihu uh, comes on the scene, very interesting young man um, who claims to be, and I believe he is, speaking by the Spirit of God. And he gives perspective as well. And when that's all finished, of course, then God says, who is this? And I don't think it sounded that way. Who is this who darkens my counsel with words without knowledge. Um, prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. And I joke around, but, but really it's, he's saying, buckle up, cupcake. Uh, I have questions for you and you're going to answer me. So we went through a number of things. Um, and just a couple that I want to hit on before we uh, go further. I think we ended around verse 34 of chapter 38. But um, he, asked, he asked the question, 
verse 7. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. So, uh, <laughs> I'm with you. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. <laughs> you remember the Beverly Hillbillies? Jed Clampett? Don't help me, boy. Don't help me, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Uh, so let's start over. Anyhow, just a couple things I wanted to review. How's that? Um, the Lord asks Job in uh, verse 17, have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the doors of the shadow of death? I mean, that's, that's still a, just a staggering question in the first place. You know, we don't know anything about death. The Bible really doesn't reveal much about death, except that it's appointed for man once to die and after that to judgment. And without Jesus Christ, you don't want to go to death, okay? But um, he says, so have you seen it? Do you know it? Because, because Job has said repeatedly a number of times in his defense that if only I could die. If I could die, this would all be over. If I could die, I would go to a place where there's silence. I would go to a place where there's peace. God's asking, really? You don't know anything about death. You know, have you been at the gates of death? He actually asked, people have different opinions about how many, but 70 or 77, I think you can come to 77 questions, and Job isn't able to answer any of them. Uh, we looked at light last time. Again, all these things are amazing. Just light itself, when, when we talk about light, you know, what the, where is the dwelling of light, he asked, verse 19. And darkness, where is its place? You know, where, by the way, where did the darkness go when the guys turned on the lights in the sanctuary tonight? Where'd the darkness go? See, because we have this idea. Okay, John, control yourself. But we have this idea, for example, we have this idea that there's, the universe is made up of matter and space, right? And so uh, everything that we see in term, you know, when we look into the skies, I mean the, the celestial skies into the heavens. Um, we see the moon, we see other planets, we see obviously the sun, but other suns, other stars. Throughout the universe, all the, you know, the Milky Way galaxy on a, on a really clear night where there's no light pollution, you can get out into the central PA somewhere. North central PA is the best way, place apparently in the United States to, to, uh, to look at the stars. But we, we look at all that and what do, we, what do we say? Well, there's matter that exists in space. Right? So everything that doesn't have planetary, you know, planetary matter, asteroids, meteors, you know, things like that, uh, that doesn't have stars or anything else that we would call material, that space itself is it's just space. It's void. And of course, first of all, one of, the, one of the discoveries really in only the last 30 or so years is that space is measurable, which is troublesome if you thought it was just empty. That it can be affected by gravity. That light, when we think of light, what is light? So we think of light as energy, travels in a wave, we know it travels in a wave, we know that you can, you can uh, put it through a prism, or you know, any kind of a prism, so water, pot, water molecules, et cetera, and you can, and you can see the Roy G. Bibb, you know, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet, that's just the visible spectrum, let alone all the others from the, from the, the ultraviolet side down to the infrared side and beyond, we know it's all part of light, it's all energy, and yet at the same time, it's made up of particles, and that it responds to gravity, which is troubling when you think it's energy. I mean, it, it does respond to gravity. So if it's material, how does that work? Well, it's not really material, but it's, a, okay. So it, it, it gets into one of those things. Um, light, I'll be out of this in a minute, but I just want to hit on these things because when he says, has, do you understand light? Have you, where's the way to the dwelling of light? Like, where does it all come from? Not the sun. Where's, where does light come from? Right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth's, the earth's out form and void, dark sun with the face of the deep. God said, let there be light. The light came on. He didn't turn the sun on. There was light. Where is light? What's the dwelling of light? And where's the dwelling of darkness? So we think that darkness is the absence of light. 
But if you know anything about a black hole, the idea of a star, usually a giant of some sort, that begins to collapse on itself, the theory being at the end of its life, as it collapses on itself, any matter as it collapses, the density of it becomes greater and greater. A, a neutron star, for going, you know, it becomes denser and denser, hence the expression denser than a neutron star. Don't use that. But anyhow, um, <laughs> but. Um, and as it does that, the light it's been emitting, it emitting is brought back into itself, and what you see instead is dark hole. Well, how do you not see the light that's even been brought in? That's troubling. And of course, it's troubling because E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times c, which is the speed of light, squared. Einstein came up with it in the, in the 30s. And it, it's the foundation of all of our modern physics and astrophysics and understanding of the nuclear code and all these things. That the transformation of, of mass and energy, there's no fixed amount in the universe. And it only moves one direction. Okay? Mass, mass moves to chaos. Second law of, uh, of thermodynamics, entropy. Okay. But if energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Speed of light is, uh, what we learned it is 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. Either way, you look at it, it's real fast, right? Um, <laughs> and C is a constant. I mean, in physics, it's a constant. You depend on the constant for the formula. If, the, if it's not constant, that's troubling. So it is a constant. But back in the early 90s, Barry Setterfield, a born-again believer, began measuring the speed of light and, and began to realize that incrementally the speed of light was decaying, that it was slowing down. And most of us say, okay, it's slowing down. But the implications for that are breathtaking because it's supposed to be a constant. So if it's a constant, then what's happening with the transformation of mass and energy? Okay. I don't want to dig too deep. What I want to say, what I want us to understand, it also has implications for even understanding time itself. And it also begins to, to answer a lot of questions because if you, reverse, if you reverse that formula, the decay of the speed of light, and start looking backward through time and say, well, if it's been decaying at a, standard, at, at, at a steady rate, probably hasn't been steady, but if it were, then what was the speed of light 6,000 years ago at creation? Which helps to answer some of the questions We'll be in Job in a moment. But <laughs> it helps to understand the question or, or to answer the question that many people ask. If you're looking at stars that are 100,000 light years away, it took 100,000 years for that light to move from that star to my eyeball, then what, why would you say the Earth is 6,000 years old? Because it took 6,000 years or 100,000 years for that light to come here. And many people say, I'm one who says, well, when God created it all, he just put the light in place. It was already mature. He didn't create Adam as an infant, he created him as a mature man. So that's, that's reasonable. But you can also conclude that based upon the decay of the speed of light, if you turn that around, all that light was immediately there. It's just one way of looking at it. Anyhow, so <laughs> those just things I thought I would mention to you. Um, and, and relative to this, so when we, what we're told by science is that two things are possible. We can move to the very, very, very large, to the point of infinite, or to the very, very small. You know, the idea that you can always cut something in half and cut something in half and cut something in half sounds great theoretically, but it's not true. Because you can only come to the point, it, it's called Planck's constant, you know, a Planck length, don't worry. Uh, anyhow, the idea, it's, it's a very small, small uh, length, 10 to the minus 3 centimeters, you don't care, but it's understood you can't get smaller than that. And infinity works in a math formula, but no one can find it. Because the two ideas is what I just said, the infinite and the very small, and chaos. Because chaos is an important concept the idea of randomness. It's a very important concept in evolution because only by randomness goes the theory, 
could things have by chance come together. Except there's no way to create something at random. Once you try to create, get it? Create something random, you're still the designer. Right? So when you think about something like the Big Bang Theory, right? In the beginning there was nothing and then it exploded, that idea? It can't be. It's not just, it's not just where did the material come from? Where did the rules come from? Where did the laws of, of gravity, transformation of energy, thermodynamics, all those things, where did all that come from? Some of you are saying, oh, brother, <laughs> you're killing me. I'm just putting those questions out there so that we could turn it around and marvel that God's the one. If, there, if you were going to say anything in terms, of, in terms of the Big Bang, et cetera, in the beginning was information. There can only be information, God. There can only be God, the information and the design. And uh, so, so anyhow, let me just read it from verse 19. So where is the way to the dwelling of light and darkness? Where is its place? That, that you may take it to its territory, that you may know the path to its home. Do you know it because you were born then or because the number of your days is great? Have you entered the treasury of snow or, or seen the treasury of hail which I have reserved for the time of trouble for the day of battle and war? I think I mentioned last time, go and read Joshua 10, the battle of Beth Horon, 75 pound hailstones. So where is this treasury of hail that God's been storing up and then when you've got this huge conflict happening um, at Beth Horon, God's hurling these 75-pound hailstones, and they're only hitting the enemy. Amazing marksmanship. God's incredible. By, by what way is light diffused or the east wind scattered over the earth? That diffusion of light, it kind of goes back to something I was saying before about the spectrum. But even in, in spectroscopy, the idea, and some of you, if you're involved in chemical processing, you know, or if you're in pharmaceuticals or chemistry or anything like that, you understand the, the value of, of a spectroscope. Um, or spectrophotometer, the idea of measuring something. How do, you, how do you reverse engineer, this is very common in industry nowadays, to take a substance and to measure the reflectivity. Because anything we see, whatever we see, the colors we see, etc., is reflected light. So all of those uh, visible wavelengths of light that we call red or purple or you know, whatever they may be, are absorbed by a, by a certain uh, substance, a fabric, a, you know, whatever it may be, and only what's reflected is what you actually see. And so you can use that same principle now to reverse engineer a product. You can measure the reflectivity back and determine the wavelength of certain molecules, and that's how you reverse engineer a product. How do you know, that, how, do you know how light is diffused? And we understand some of these things today, but we're just kids on the beach making sandcastles. That's all we're doing. That's all we're doing. As, as, as intelligent as we think we are relative to others you know, in, in a field, uh, but that's, that's all it is. Who's divided a channel for the overflowing water or a path for the thunderbolt to cause it to rain on the land where there is no one, a wilderness in which there is no man to satisfy the desolate waste and, to cause, and, and cause to spring forth the growth of tender grass. In other words, um, who's watering those places where there is no human being? God's still watering those places. God's still taking care of the animals. Um, you know, it, it rains in the desert. No one's there. But by, we can have faith. God continues to grow uh, and to take care of the plants and the animals. You know, we, we have this idea of, you know, and it goes back to that, randomness idea or that what if how do you know something is or is not you know and we you play a philosophical game you know if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it did it make a noise you know or actually the modern idea is if a man speaks in the forest and there's no woman there to hear him is he still wrong yeah you know, uh okay yeah i know all the women are saying yeah yeah by the way why and th this idea of flowers you know, we look at flowers, I think I've mentioned this before, but we look at flowers and we look at their colors and how beautiful they are. And why is that? And we're told that's to attract bees at different times in, in, the, in the spring, in the summer, etc. Until you begin to investigate further and realize that most bees are colorblind. So then, what is the purpose 
of the color. It's for your pleasure and God's pleasure. You know, it's the anthropic principle. That's part of the anthropic principle. You may not depend on the color of a rose to live, but it's still there for our pleasure. It's for God's pleasure, for his glory, and for our pleasure. Does the rain have a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? A lot of these things I've just got to, you know, glaze over. But um, hopefully you won't glaze over. But anyhow, um, does the rain have a father? Who's begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice and the frost of heaven who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. You know, if you look at the basic principles that, that we live by, we depend on, we understand that um, the, the warmer a material is, the larger it becomes. It may not be an enormous growth, but you, know, you take a, a piece of iron, you heat it up, it's going to be larger than if you cooled it down very far. It would shrink in size. There's a reason uh, that you know, we build things with, with gaps in them so that, or, or, or roadways, okay? So that in the wintertime, um, they... they they shrink down in the summertime. The gap is taken up by the expansion of the road. That's a principle that works throughout. But water doesn't obey that by God's design, because when ice, when water freezes, ice expands. That's why it floats. So when a lake or a river freezes, it doesn't freeze from the bottom up. It freezes on the top. That's why the fish live. You depend on that. We don't think about it, but for our lives, we depend on it. In fact, the whole ecosystem does. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or loosen the belt of Orion? And uh, you know, as you look at the constellations, I, and, and I like the stars, uh, you know, I like the, I'm, I'm, not, I don't even, I'm not an amateur astronomer, but I enjoy it, and I, one of these days I'm gonna get myself a telescope. But, um, when we look at the constellations, you know, whatever it is that you may look at, uh, you know, look at the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper, these types of things. We look at them, we say, see, there's a Big Dipper, there's a Little Dipper. You think, I try to point them out to my grandkids, but it's like they don't know what I'm pointing at. But um, so we see those things. We say that constellation means something. But those stars, see, we tend to look at the sky, especially the, the night sky, as a two-dimensional surface. It's not, we know it's not, but we look at it as if it is. So when we see a constellation, we see, you know, whatever, eight, ten points of light against that two-dimensional uh, table, so to speak. Except those stars are tens and hundreds of thousands of light years away from one another. It's just relative to us, it looks like it's two-dimensional. Except for, this is interesting, it, well, it might be. It is to me. The Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters, it's kind of close to the Little Dipper. If, if you guys know the Little Okay. For those of you who care, um, it's close to the Little Dipper, called the Seven Sisters. You look at it on a clear night, or with, if you have good eyes, or with binoculars, you'll see there's actually more than seven stars. But typically, it looks like seven stars, seven sisters. And they all are there, as is the constellation Orion. All those stars stand within gravitational fields of one another. How did Job, or whoever wrote this, how did he know it? Well, God's asking the question. He's the one who put it together that way. And can you bring out the Matzerot in its season? I, I mentioned this last time, but uh, just superficially. So I want to go a little bit deeper. The Matzerot, some people will say, well, that's the Zodiac. Okay, uh, close enough, close for jazz, but I wouldn't be happy with that. The Matzerot, and and and... This is a transliteration. It's not a translation of the Hebrew word. So, tran the, so, the, so it would be matzorot in Hebrew. And, and what is it? Well, it's basically the same constellations as you think of when you think of the zodiac. But God put them in place. Genesis 1-4, he, he put the stars. You know, the, the, he put the, the sun and the moon, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And, and I always love the one, you know, the, the one line, and he also made the stars. Like, it's like a throwaway line. He also made the stars. You know, and, and the more you look at the stars, it's like, he also made the stars. But he put them in the heavens for signs and for seasons. And part of that is 
uh, there's, there are these certain constellations that move along the ecliptic in the sky. And, and you, could, you, know, you could tell what time of year it is. You probably already knew that by the temperature. But you know, they, they, they appear in the sky at certain times of the year. Well, the Matsuro was the ancient Hebrew understanding of something God had done because what God had done is put the gospel in the stars. It's kind of controversial. I don't, uh, that doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, great, two great books, if you're interested. Uh, gospel in the Stars is the title of one. I forget the other, but J.A. Seiss and E.W. Bullinger are the guys who wrote them. Um, and the idea that God put a gospel message in the stars long before Christ obviously, right? And so here's the Matsuro with, with, with a system, I, I say a system, you know, a, a, a plan that begins with the Virgo, the virgin, holding a, an ear of corn. Jesus said, unless, uh, unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and abides alone, but if it dies, right? Um, so here's Virgo, the virgin, and moving along all the way out to Leo, Leo the lion. Uh, even the tribe's of Israel adopted those 12 different uh, constellations as symbols on their banners as they traveled through the wilderness. Um, so anyhow, you have that, but, but long before that, after the flood, of course we have this character Nimrod, we shall rebel is what his name means, and, and he's the one behind the building of the Tower of Babel, he's the first worldwide dictator after the flood. and and. What he apparently did, I'm, I'm blaming him because I don't know who else to blame, but um, the, the, this idea, if you think about it, the zodiac, which is the pagan corruption of the Matsurot, okay, which says that you can, that you can tell a person's character by what, what constellation was predominant in the sky when they were born, like Okay, I don't know how that caused that. Yeah, you know, the airplanes flying over would have more gravitational effect on you than the constellations. But anyhow, um, but that idea that the zodiac, the, this pagan corruption, is prevalent on in every culture around the world. They may use different words to describe them, but they all agree. Now, how did that happen? I would say Nimrod was the one behind the corruption at Babel in the plains of Shinar, and when God when God confused their languages and everybody moved away finding people they could communicate with. That was at the same time, if, if you follow carefully in Genesis 11, while the continents were moving too. So the people with their different languages went to different areas, you know, land areas, while they didn't know the continents were moving, while the continents were moving. So that Matsuro, which was corrupted at, at, ba at Babylon, or Babel, Tower of Babel, now becomes the zodiac, this pagan corruption, on every continent and every culture, major culture in the world. Something to think about. Um, but can you bring out Matsuro in a season? Can, can you guide the great, beer, the great bear um, with its cubs? Or it's another translation is Arcturus. Can you guide it? Arcturus is called the runaway star. It moves at 125,000 miles an hour. Um, basically, can you steer this through, through the Milky Way? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you set their dominion? over the earth. In other words, can you, can you change the weather? Come on, Job. You've asked all these questions. You've complained. You must be able to do these things. Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that an abundance of water may cover you? Again, the weather. Can you send out lightning that they may go and say to you, Where? Uh, here we are. Who's put wisdom in the mind? Or in the inward parts. I think it's King James. Who's put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who's given understanding to the heart? I mean, where does this stuff come from anyhow? Who can number the clouds by wisdom or pour out the bottles of heaven when the dust hardens in clumps? Again, this idea in the desert, when the clouds um, cling together. And by the way, Job, who feeds the animals? Let's talk about that. Can you hunt prey? These next three verses probably belong in verse 39. Can you hunt prey for the lions? Can you satisfy the appetite of, of, of their cubs, the lion cubs? When they crouch in their dens, they lurk in their lairs and to, to lie in wait. And who provides food for the ravens? When its young ones cry out to God and wander about for lack of food, right? God's the one who's supplying their needs. Do you know the time? And now God's going to talk about obstetrics. You know, you know a lot, Job. So do you know the time? when the wild mountain goats bear their young? 
Can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the, number the months that they fulfilled? Do you know their gestation period? Each one has their own. Do you, do you understand all that stuff? Or do you know the time when they bear their young? They bow down. They bring forth their young. They deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain. They depart. They do not return to them. And who set the wild donkey free? Who made it wild in the first place? Who loosed the bonds of the onager, which is like a, some, a species of the wild donkey? Whose home I've made the wilderness and the barren land is dwelling. He scorns the tumult of the city. He doesn't heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture. He searches after every green thing. This, this wild donkey stays away from people. He shows judgment, apparently. Will the, and now, New King James says wild ox. Uh, if you have King James, it says unicorn. Don't get too excited. Because <laughs> it's not what you think. Um, can, will the unicorn or will the wild ox, it's actually just, it was, a, it was an animal that this wild ox is extinct. It's been extinct the, since the 1600s, actually. Um, uh, you don't care about the Hebrew word for it. But anyhow, it's, it's called an auroch in English. It's called an auroch. And it was a fierce, large, wild ox. Um, but it was hunted a lot and probably for different reasons. It, it had lasted as long as it could after the flood. That's my opinion. Uh, and it, it couldn't sustain itself anymore. Uh, will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox, this, this one, uh, the, uh, in the furrow with ropes? In other words, are you going to take this fierce, wild what ox, this enormous animal, you're going to use it to plow your fields? Come on, Job, you're trying to be like me. So you must be able to, to command these kinds of animals. Will he plow the valleys behind you? <laughs> no, you'll lose. Will, will you trust him because his strength is great, or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain. God's being facetious, obviously. And we trust him to bring home your grain and gather it uh, to your threshing floor. And God's going through all this and saying, the untamable nature of these animals is something that only I can tame, man cannot, right? The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are her wings and pinions like the kindly storks? I mean, just the idea in the first place. Have you ever looked at an ostrich? That it has wings. I mean, it can't fly. What's the purpose of the wings? Really, now, I'm serious. Because God's going to say, this is a dumb animal, and I made it that way. I mean, really, you've got you to find God's sense of humor in this. It's got wings, and it can't fly. There's nothing it can do with its wings. Are her wings and her pinions like the kindly storks? She leaves her eggs on the ground. Now, think about this. She leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust. She forgets that a foot may crush them, or that a wild beast may break them. She treats her young harshly as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without concern. I mean, th think about this. She, she lays her eggs in the ground. Leaves, a lot of times, and a lot of studies have shown, doesn't know how to find them again. Another ostrich may come along and say, oh, the eggs, i got to sit on them. So it sits on the eggs. This other ostrich, I mean, think about it. The, doesn't come back to its own young, goes to someone else's, another ostrich's young. Imagine your mom did that. <laughs> Went out shopping for groceries and, and came back to a different house and fed those kids and not you. you know? I mean, that's the idea here. <laughs> God's saying, have you considered how stupid this bird is? Why, because God deprived her of wisdom and didn't endow her with understanding. When she lifts herself on high... When she lifts herself on high, she scorns the horse and its rider. In other words, they've clocked the ostrich running at 40 miles an hour. So it may be dumber than a bag of hammers in one sense, but at the same time, it can outrun a horse. And then he gets into uh, this poem, and I'm just going to read it, you know, this, this poem. The Hebrew, this is poetry, and, the, and Hebrew poetry is difficult in the first place, and this is such ancient poetry, it's really kind of difficult to translate. But um, So I'll, I'll just... I mean, I mean, by the way, in this whole idea of the ostrich, when you think of it being dumb, and then God designed it that way, have you ever looked at like a, uh, the duck-billed platypus? Have you ever looked at a duck-billed platypus? I mean, it looks like it was made out of spare parts. Really. Really, look at it. Huh? It's cute. Cute, okay. It's cute. What they say, the camel is a horse designed by committee. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, um, because some, some animals just, they, 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 you know. So, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. If you know horses, I mean, this is a, this is great description. Um, he pauses in the valley, rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear. He's not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against them, the glittering spear and javelin he devours the distance with fierceness and rage, nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet has sounded. At the blast of the trumpet, he says, ha ha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shouting. He has this unique character and God's describing it here. Do you understand this, Job? And the hawk. Let's talk about the hawk, Job. Does the hawk fly by your wisdom? Does it spread its wings uh, uh, and spread its wings toward the south? Does the eagle mount up at your command and make its nest on high? On the rock it dwells and resides, on, on the crag of the rock and the stronghold. From there it spies out the prey, it eyes, its eyes observe from afar, its young ones suck up blood, and, and, and where the slain are, there it is. Uh, you know, if you're uh, an eagle, it's... it's no time to get into the eagle, but just real quick. I mean, the eagle, I mean, imagine it, you know, waking up in the morning, kind of stretching its wings. It's got, you know, it's got this big nest way up high on the cliffs. And, and it looks, I mean, that idea of the eagle eye, you know. And from there it looks, thinking, what do I feed the kids today? So two miles away, think about this. Two miles away, there's a mouse. There's a rabbit over there. There's a coney over there. Kids, what do you want? I don't know what he said, but she, she says, waits for the rocks to heat up, and now the thermals begin to rise, and it just jumps out and rides the thermals. And this idea of being able to see, I think the idea is seeing a mouse a mile away on a rooftop. It's equivalent to us being able to read a newspaper two blocks away. I couldn't read it, you know, 40 feet away. Neither could you. None of us can, you know. Amazing what God has done. And, you know, I, uh, real quick, maybe you're familiar with the, the golden plover. Not pullover, plover. <laughs> what was dumb and dumber? The cop says, pull over. No, it's cardigan. Uh, anyhow, um, but the golden plover. Here's a bird that flies, now think about this, flies from Alaska to Hawaii as the, as, as the summer ends in Alaska, it flies from Alaska to Hawaii, straight, 250,000 wing flaps it required. Now, this is a bird that weighs 80 grams, 80 grams. It, it or excuse me, 120 grams. It puts on 120, I'll start over. It weighs 120, it puts on 80 grams because it needs fat, it needs f fuel for the trip. And when it arrives in Hawaii, it has like six grams to spare. By the way, where would it have stopped? It can't swim. There aren't, there's no land in between. If it was a tenth of a percent off in its flight, it would have missed Hawaii by many, many, many miles. How does it know to do that? It doesn't remember it from the last time it did it. And how would, if it did, how would you explain that for its young, who also know how to do that? How does it know where it's going and how to get there? People say, well, it navigates by the stars. Well, half the time it's overcast. So how does it do that? Apparently there's some, you know, and a number of birds seem to have this magnetic thing in, in their head that they, they follow along the magnetic waves of the earth. I don't, I don't understand it, but you can marvel at it. It's just marvel that, that God does this. Just a bird, eh? Um, you know, Jesus said, are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? <laughs> Think about it. Um, and the hairs of your head are numbered. You know, we, so we see the golden plover and we marvel at it. You're worth far more than the golden plover, you know? More where the Lord answered, chapter 40, shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Um, and, and the he who rebukes God, let him answer it. 
So God's going to come back and, and ask these questions again. And Job answered the Lord, and he said, Behold, I'm vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, I will, I, I, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I'll proceed no further. And the Lord said, basically, he's saying, No, no, I've got, I've got more questions, Job. Now prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you. You answer me. Would you indeed annul my judgment? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? Because that's what he's done. That's, that's the idea here. Would you condemn me? Not that Job thought he's condemning God. We don't think about the subtleties of what we're really saying when we say, that's not fair. That this should happen to me. Who, what is God doing that this would happen to me? And then we're condemning God in, you know, in, in terms of his judgment. And God's now bringing moral judgment into the discussion. He says, do you have an arm like God? Can you thunder with a voice like his? So then adorn yourself with majesty and, and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty. In other words, he's saying, if you can, come on up. Sit on the throne with me. You take the throne. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who's proud and, 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 and humble him. Look on everyone who's proud, bring him low, tread down the wicked in their place, hide them in the dust together, bind their faces in the hidden darkness, and then I will confess to you that your own right hand can save you. In other words, if you can handle all this, then you can solve your problems. But you can't, so you can't. And now he starts something. He says, look at the behemoth. And here's an animal. That's a very strange one. In fact, the next 44 verses, it's been 47 verses so far asking all these questions, specifically about animals. 44 verses are now taken up by two animals, Behemoth and Leviathan. And many people believe that, uh, and a lot of your commentators will say, and maybe a lot of your notes in your Bibles will say, that Behemoth is an elephant or it's a rhinoceros. But what I think what we need to do is just read through and what does the text say is, is the question. So look now at Behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar and the sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. Uh, let's, so... Uh, do you have a picture of an elephant in your mind? No, have you ever seen an elephant? You got a picture of an elephant in your mind? Now think, of, think of the tail on an elephant. Does it look like a cedar to you? No. That scrawny little thing, like a little hair on the end? Or, or the rhino and what that thing looks like? So God's saying that it has a tail like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. Wow, I mean, God's pretty descriptive. He uses word pictures really well. His ribs are like bars of iron. He's the first of the ways of God. Only he, meaning only God, can make him bring, only him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marshes. Well, look, I mean, I'll read further here in a moment, but this is, I, I don't think there's any question, but you're entitled to your own opinion. Um, this is a dinosaur. And, and many Christians I've found have trouble understanding how there could be dinosaurs. And some people don't even believe that there were dinosaurs, in which case I say, you need to go to a natural history museum and see the dinosaur skeletons, they're there. Uh, and there are a lot of really cool places, if you had a chance, go around the country. You know, to, uh, a dinosaur national park out in Utah is like, boom, great. You know, when you can, anyhow. Um, these, are, these are creatures that God created that existed before the flood that were preserved on the ark. I mean, it, no, it didn't bring big brontosaurus and T-Rexes, you know, these big animals onto the ark. He brought babies. You know, he brought small ones. It's not stupid. Um, and, and they exist afterward. But the, the life on planet Earth post-flood versus pre-flood, very different, and wasn't able to sustain them. So most of those who, uh, who came off that ark reproduced, but they weren't able to survive. But some 
did, certainly if this is the earliest of all the books. So we're still in existence in some form here, enough so that Job understood what God's talking about. He know, God, God knows what he's saying, and Job understands what God is saying. By the way, he, uh, there's so much speculation that goes into a lot of this, which is troubling. But when he says here, you know, he, he lies in the lotus trees in a covert of reeds and marshes, verse 21, um, in the, uh, I always forget the name of it. The, anyhow, it's a marsh, and um, it's a swamp in the Congo and Zaire. It's 50, 55,000 square miles. That's a, that's a big area. And there are constant reports of dinosaur-like creatures in that place. Some of you are thinking, there he goes again. You got to be kidding me. Look it up for yourself. Look it up for yourself. I'm not talking about Nessie. All right, that's not what I'm talking about. But the idea, you know, the Loch Ness Monster. I'm not talking about that. Um, but that some still exist today, I don't, I don't doubt that. I think there's far less than there used to be. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. Uh, the willows by the brook surround him. Indeed, the river may rage, yet he's not disturbed. He's confident, though a Jordan gushes into his mouth. It's a Jordan, not the Jordan. Not like the Jordan River. They, that's translators tried to say that. But in other words, it's a large, that Jordan is used as a descriptor of a large volume of something. So he swallows a, a large amount, uh, Jordan, of, of water. Um, though he takes it in his eyes and, or one pierces his nose with a snare. So this is some type, and I would say this and I'd leave it here for our purposes tonight, some type of a super serpent of some sort. And while we're there, Job, let's talk about Leviathan. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Now some people say, Leviathan is either a um, crocodile or a whale. And um, I, I do still think we need to just let the text speak for itself because I've never seen a crocodile or a whale like this. Can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make supplications to you? Will, will he speak softly? To you, you know, the, I think as we go through this, when we speak of dragons, in fact, even for many of you, when I say that, when, when, when we say dragon, most of us think immediately mythology, right? I understand that, but, but we do. And, and by the way, there, there's a reason for, oh, the, there it is, uh, the, the Likawala Swamp. That helps you. Um, L-I-K-O-U-L-A. Um, but anyhow, so when, but these, this is a dragon of some sort, Leviathan. Let's see what else it says. It says here, will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him or, as, as with a bird? Or will, will you leash him for your maidens? Will, you, will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons? Or could you fill his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle. You'll never do it again. Indeed, any hope of Overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare to stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? Who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. Who can remove his outer coat? Who can approach him with a double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? The doors of his face. That's a, that's a big face. Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? Watch this. His rows of scales are his pride. They're shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They're joined one to another. They stick together, and they cannot be parted. Crocodiles, whales, I mean, you know, we've got zoos. We've got Sea World. We, we've got those things in zoos. We don't have this in a zoo. 
This idea of dragons, I'm saying, telling you, this is important stuff. When we talk about dinosaurs and dragons, if you're interested in more information, I highly recommend it. Kent Hoven is, is great, look him up. Uh, or, but you know, Gen Answers in Genesis is a wonderful resource. Uh, Institute for Creation Research. Those three are great. It's easy to find them online. There's so much out there. It's never taught to our kids. His, I love this, his sneezings. <laughs> Boy, when something like that sneezes, you want to be careful. His sneezings, now watch this, his sneezings flash forth light. What? And his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils. As from a boiling pot and burning rushes, his breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. You gotta be kidding. Uh, really, I mean, you gotta be kidding when you read this. We're say fire breathing dragon. Now we know it's mythology because that's only found in mythology. Well, that's not true. And, and, you know, and, and actually what's interesting some of the dinosaurs that have been excavated, their skulls have a certain protrusion with a cavity behind it, and the assumption is that it was a place where a certain chemical or chemicals could be mixed that when exhaled, exposed to oxygen, it became a flame. And of course, some people are like, yeah, to be king. Look it up, the bombardier beetle. The bombardier beetle does the same thing, it mixes Two chemicals, I don't know what they are, but you probably didn't care. But two chemicals, shoots it out of its, um, out of, out of its rear. It's its defense mechanism. And, and it emits a cloud of smoke, and it gives them a chance to get away. So the principle is already extant. It, it's already happening. So why would it not be possible in a dragon? And by the way, there are, there are a number of... Um, Number of resources. Uh, the, um, in 1977, Japanese fishermen found uh, uh, they found something as they pulled it up from like 900 feet down. Uh, they pulled up this dragon-like creature that was over 40 feet long. It weighed close to a thousand pounds. There was no way they could bring it on board uh, the boat. It's a fishing boat, right? How, how could they do that? So they took pictures. You could find this stuff online. Um, they took pictures, a lot of measurements. Um, that We could go on. You wouldn't want it, so I didn't do it. But we could go on for two hours. I mean, there's lots of stuff. You can look this stuff up yourself. But there are books already of, of uh, discoveries by, um, by, by ships throughout the 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900s, and coming across these seagoing dinosaurs. Um, some really enormous. Don't trust some of the videos that you see on YouTube. That it's bogus. But, but, um, but I just want to finish this. We'll go three minutes over. Because I think it's important. By the way, this idea of dragon... You know, I mean, dragons are, dragons are spoken of and important in really most cultures of the world. Um, Western Europe has a lot of dragon, you know, uh, mythology. We consider it mythology. And, of course, the big one, of course, is China. Um, uh, the, uh, there was a Chaldean dragon, if you're familiar with the, the symbols of ancient Babylon, you know, the flying dragon, a big, a big dragon with wings. Um, in China, um, the, uh, there were four of them. The, the Chenlong, which is the celestial dragon, the Futsanglong, uh, the dragon of hidden treasure, the Tilong, the earth dragon, and the Shenlong is the spiritual dragon. But here's the kicker even though it, you know, they're, they're prevalent in Chinese and Japanese cultures. That last one that I mentioned, the spiritual dragon, Shenlong, is also known, um, is referred to as the power of the air. Now, some, you know, I could tell you're sensitive to that. So, you know, uh, Paul says in, in Ephesians 2 that we were led along, you know, in our, in our trespasses and sins, led along by the spirit of the power of the air. The last judgment that's poured out on the earth in, in Revelation 
is poured out on the air. You know, against all the, the forces of spiritual wickedness. There's a lot more to go through on that, but I'm just, I just say that for your... Let me just read this through and end on one thing, because I think it helps to zero in on what God is getting at with Job, why he says this. And then we'll, we'll pick up on the rest of this next week in chapter 42. The folds of his flesh, verse 23, are joined together. They're firm on him. They can't be moved. His heart is as hard as stone even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid because of his crashings. They're beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail. Nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw. He regards bronze as rotted wood. The arrow can't make him flee. Sling stones become like stubble to him. Darts are regarded as straw. He laughs at the threat of javelin. His undersides are like sharp potsherds. He, he spreads pointed marks in the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. He leaves a shining wake behind him. One would think the deep had white hair on earth. There's nothing like him which is made without fear. Part of the reason I'm going through that is if you'll remember, because I don't have time to get into it tonight, but you know, as you get into Isaiah 14, is we have this description of Lucifer, right? Yeah. And you know, the, the five I wills of Lucifer. And then Ezekiel 28, you remember them because they're multiples, and 14, 28. Ezekiel 28. Lucifer is described, but God refers to him as the king of Tyre. This is a mechanism God uses with some frequency in Old Testament prophecy where he takes a description of a spiritual being, most often it's, 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 a, well, it's always of Satan, but he describes a wicked world leader. So what he's done here, what God, I believe, is doing here, my opinion, is that he's taken this description of this actual beast, this fire-breathing dragon, this Leviathan. He's gone through this description, but that he's really describing Satan because then he says, verse 34, he beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So now what was the issue? See, there was a, there, 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 uh, Satan says to God, he brings out the challenge, right? Against Job, he brings it to God. Twice he does that. It, the, the, when pride was found in Lucifer, that's the first sin. Pride is the, is the root of all sin. What God's getting at here is the one behind all of this. Do you really have control over this? Only I do, God is saying. Now, I, I want to dig further into that as we get into chapter 42 last, next week, and we'll sum it up. But I think that's the way that we can understand. Because think of all the dragon and serpent references that you find just in the Bible. He's always pointing to who? Satan. Satan. So that's what God has done here. And that last verse, to me, is the kicker. That his, he's king over all the children of pride.